Now that you are registered and settled in Figma, we're now going to move on to creating new files. Now there are two types of files. We have the design file and the figjam file. Initially, you'd like to start by exploring the figjam file just because this is where you're going to be drafting and planning your project. And you're going to very simply uh, produce one by clicking on the plus sign and then a window is going to open up for you. This window is going to be kind of like your whiteboard, your draft area. You're, you have the different features to help you through with what you're going to do and it's very simple to use. Now let's start by very generally talking about these um, tools here. We have obviously the move tool which is the mouse and then the hand tool which moves around the canvas in case your mouse is not capable of going uh, more flexibly. And then we have the pen tool which we're able to maybe handwrite things with. We have the shapes tool which provides you with eight different shapes that you can use all, all while also adding text. We have the stickies tool, which also helps you with adding text. This one also shows your name on it. And then we have the text tool, which helps you place texts here without having to use a sticky or a shape. We have the connect which um, kind of is going to be more helpful in the future. We have the, we have the library, which um, helps you with teamwork stuff. Basically, you would be adding stickers as you and your team are planning through things here. You can add text very easily to the stickers. And then you have the stamp tool where, for example, if you approve of something, you can very simply just stamp a thumbs up and it is going to be showing to other people on your team. And finally, you can very easily place an image within the artboard. These are all very general features that I'm going through just because it's going to be talked about in the next class. But for now, um, these are the most used things within this application. One thing though, if you're uncomfortable with the dots and you would like a clear page, you can also go to view from this drop down button here, view and then remove the dot grid so that you can work on a completely white board if you'd like. It obviously depends on preferences, but feel free to do whatever suits you. And then we also have um, the preferences where you snap dot to grid because when we work now it kind of um, is a freestyle let's go back to show dot grid but when we don't use the dot grid we're more free to like move our sticky wherever meanwhile if we just snap dot to grid we are um, more restricted to like move less smoothly but we would be more organized now obviously you can feel free to do otherwise but just in case this snaps everything all the objects to match up on the lines of the grid and these are the main features of the um fig jam as for the design file obviously you're gonna also create a new one by pressing on the plus sign and then you're gonna and then you're going to enter this page where you're going to be doing very much more detailed work. I'm going to get into it in another class, but for now, this is how it looks like. Uh, another note is in case you want to be as organized as possible, you're going to very simply just name your project according to what it is through this tab here. So now it's currently untitled. I just pressed on it and I will name it project one and there you have it. 
Now, for group work purposes, if you'd like to work on this program and draft with a group, there are a lot of uh, features that you're able to access, which I'm going to also be discussing in detail later on. Uh, this feature includes the cursor chat where you would like to point at something and say maybe nice job to someone or any of that. And then we also have the timer. So maybe there's an activity that needs maybe three minutes, maybe like two seconds. And then the timer ends and the results are perceived with the team. These are all, like I said, the main features of the Fig Jam that we're going to be looking into the next class. But for now, this is what it does. And we can get started and dive into it. Now, just like artists start uh, their process by sketching, their drafts, their paintings, their designs, the same thing applies to user interface design. We start the process by user journey mapping. What is user journey mapping, you may be wondering? Uh, it is also called user flow diagrams or customer journey mapping, etc. And it is a diagram that visually illustrates the user flow through your website or application or anything that you're trying to produce through Figma. It starts with the initial contact with the application and continues through the process of engagement into long-term advocacy. It identifies key interactions with your website or application and describes in detail the customer's goals, motivations, and feelings at each step. There is a process to creating your user journey map, just like there is a process to start sketching, like brainstorming, etc. But in the case of user journey mapping, you start by choosing your personas. A persona is a target audience customer. Uh, that you are creating uh, specifically to match what you think the person will be using the app will be and it's not only based on assumptions it should be based on general ideas like let's say I'm targeting middle-aged moms so I would be looking at their age at their occupations at their location their device type, their tasks or goals that they want to accomplish through this app. And from there, I create a persona. I will get into that again um, very quickly in a bit. After creating your personas, um, you have to map the touch points. So a touch point example could be a typical buyer's journey is like online purchasing, for example, it would be awareness, I want to buy something, research, they research the object that they want to buy, purchase, after researching and finding what they want to buy, they purchase it, and then use, which is using the item after they purchase it. So these are very general touch points that would help the user understand um, what exactly they will be going through and then after mapping the touch points you would be creating a narrative and a narrative contains maybe actions motivations emotions that occur at each interaction or touch point so let's say for example uh, someone is having trouble logging in uh, they forgot their password or any of that I'm sure that they would feel more frustrated than someone who is logging into his account very easily or stressed, you know? So from there, we try to make it easier for someone who is stressed by providing the forgot your password button be as bold as possible. All of these are going to be very easy to understand as we're working through the projects. But moving on, after we create a general narrative, we visualize our narrative. So I'm going to show you a quick example of a user journey map. This is a very complicated version of it. Obviously, uh, you're not expected to get straight into such detailed mapping. But we created a persona, which is not shown here. But the persona is someone who exercises 
obviously because this is a health tracking system um, interface and then from the persona we're trying to create general touch points these are the touch points which are the user's last exercise was cycling they select jogging and start jogging they put their cell phone in their pocket they measure their blood oxygen while jogging these are all very general touch points and from this like narrative that we have um, we're starting to understand maybe emotions or like levels so this is the part where the person the user is um, about to start exercising this is the part where they are exercising and then this is when they were interrupted because they remember they need to make a phone call and then the last point is when they return home so here's our narrative and from there we create a visualization the visualization usually starts at a specific starting point um, to make things feel more d divided because they divided each narrative into different colors they go on with the colors with the map just to make sure that they're going in the right way so in a health tracking app you would have the steps number out of the target the daily distance the daily calories that they spent out of the target calories that they want to spend daily sleep time uh, last weight last blood pressure, last stress level, last blood oxygen level. These are all things that you would find in a health tracking application. And then from here, uh, some people like to make it easier for them by adding maybe like a bullet list of um, buttons. So the first button would be exercise, which you press and then uh, go to the exercise mode and then wait when you want to weigh yourself, settings to press on settings, and then dashboard is just maybe a home button. But this is where they are now, they're in the dashboard. Uh, and then you try different scenarios. So if the person presses on A, which is exercise, then they move to another page that has generally s some similar things, but then it has additional objects like favorite exercises, typical things you would find in an exercise page and then let's say that this person chose x1 which is exercise number one after choosing any of the two x's really they get to see the x exercise that they chose the date and time that they last did it the duration that they last did it the achievements the heart rate uh, and so on and so forth so after setting a scenario where the user's last exercise was cycling and then wants to start jogging and then puts the cell phone in her pocket, we're going to go in a specific pattern here. So the user starts with the home page, which is the dashboard, goes on to press on A since she wants to go jogging, and then uh, after seeing the exercise uh, page, they go and press on jogging, which could be X1 or X2. When they press on jogging, they can see like the last time you jogged was maybe two days ago. It was for two hours. Uh, you walked for five kilometers, etc. And then they have the start exercise button. In our scenario here, She's going to start jogging and then puts the cell phone in her pocket. So after starting, pressing on start X exercise, which is start jogging, E, we go on and start jogging. Usually it would have something that you would want to appeal to your target audience. In this case, they chose to have maybe an animated countdown. And we will get into how to do that very soon. But anyways, it starts with a countdown. And because the person does not press any button, it just automatically goes to the next page. Uh, here's when the person turns off her phone because she's running. And then we can see here in the scenario that she wants to measure her blood oxygen level while jogging. 
So now we're starting with the green scenario. The green scenario comes after the screen was closed. It has the clock time, the heart rate, the calories burnt since they started jogging, the duration that they have, and then there's the get blood oxygen level button, and then there's a pause exercise button. These are all logical things that you would know. Uh, obviously, in the scenario, the person wants to get her blood oxygen level, so she presses on button P, which takes us to blood oxygen level kind of like page or tab. And then she presses on the start measuring button. And from there, it starts measuring in an animated process, maybe like a loading bar or something. And from there, uh, she gets her result and she can press on done. After pressing on done, she goes back to the main page, but obviously not with the same um, option here, but it would actually get the blood oxygen level number. Afterwards, in the scenario, the user remembers that she needs to make an important phone call and pauses her exercise on her phone. So from there, she goes, she opens her phone, and she sees that she needs to pause the exercise. There's a pause exercise button that she's going to be pressing on. After she presses on it, here it shows how it would look like on the phone and the watch because it has both versions. So it says on the watch that the exercise is paused as well as on the phone. And then there's a stop and resume button, which is a normal thing to have. And then from there, she goes to make the phone call. So she decides to stop the exercise on her watch. And from there, she presses on A. After pressing on A, she verifies, obviously, when a user is doing making actions, like we mentioned earlier, you want to give them safety and make sure that they're choosing the right option. So when they stop an exercise, it is more permanent than pausing it. When you pause an exercise, you don't really need to confirm because it's not going to stop the entire process. It is just on hold. But stopping an exercise is more committed. So what you would do here is put maybe a verification message or a box. And then from there, it would go straight to the home page. Or it could also go back to the exercise with the last exercise being jogging and it was like two minutes ago, the duration, maybe 15 minutes, etc, etc. I know that I probably gave you a lot of detailed information at once, but I would like to now create in front of you another user journey map just to make it extra clear. Um, I'm going to be doing that in the next video, so if you're more curious and if you're a little confused, don't worry, it's going to be easier. We're going to create one together. We're going to start by creating our personas and then mapping the touch points, creating a narrative, and then visualize it into a map like this one. But this time we're going to be using Figma like mentioned.